was done that was an unconscionable action, but in terms of what he could do, he had to recognize uh, that uh, whatever we might want to say, even after this incident, things remain the same. I mean, after all, those that murder their way to the, tops in the, cr to the top in the Kremlin are not going to have any qualms about murder in the sky, uh, and that's all this indicates. Uh, the Soviet have been this way before. This is the latest example of it, but they are there. And what we have to do is to find a way uh, to give them incentives to keep the peace and incentives against this kind of activity uh, in a hard-headed way. Do you think this went to the top in the Kremlin, or do you think it was a local error? Callous, <coughs> brutal, but an, a local error? Local error. No, there's, uh, I don't know Mr. Andropov personally, uh, but uh, from everything that I know about him, he's a highly intelligent man. He has a good sense of public relations for one who lives in that kind of closed society. Uh, he was trying at this particular time uh, to sort of cool things down between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and they were reaching out in terms of trade and other areas. They need us, let's face it. Uh, he's trying to disarm uh, the uh, armament movement in Europe and in the United States, for that matter. Uh, he's trying to help the peace groups, and uh, he's, he's not a stupid man. He's not going to shoot himself in the foot. No, I think he... I wouldn't be surprised to see somebody executed for what happened here, just for stupidity. Will we ever know about that? No, would they make that public? Never. But that, that would be this, the strength of their response to a mistake like this right. and the nature of their That's kind right. of response. It is possible that it would be that way. On the other hand, uh, there was a similar incident to this about in 19, uh, five years ago in 1978. A Korean, another Korean plane got off course. It was down. Two people were killed. What happened there that there was investigation apparently in the Soviet Union and at least two of those responsible for allowing the plane in and the handling of the matter were executed. The point is you're more likely to have an execution uh, of uh, one of those in the ground who allowed an intruder uh, to get into Soviet airspace than one who even mistakenly shot it down. I'm simply saying uh, he would have no qualms about it. My guess is, however, that uh, he's very, very paranoid about having any intrusion in their airspace, and uh, he would hesitate to take action that would discourage uh, people, uh, his own people, on the ground from uh, avoiding it. Is uh, Sakhalin Island uh, like Dr. No's Island? Uh, is there something going on there that's so secret that they're, that they're super sensitive about that particular place? I don't know, uh, but I would hope that investigation is being made in that direction. I, and I would think uh, that it is a very, very important base, or otherwise they wouldn't be quite that paranoid about it. Do you think Andropov is capable, uh, if it had come up to him, uh, of making a decision to take out, to take down a, an unarmed passenger plane if he had been told that it was over this uh, sensitive area? No doubt about it. No, after all, we have to remember uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, I don't know of any Soviet le le leader who's been the head of the Soviet Union that didn't uh, murder his way to the top. Uh, I don't mean by that uh, individually here and there, uh, but executions, uh, participating in purges and so forth, uh, that is one of the requirements for going up in the Soviet hierarchy. He was the head of the KGB. Uh, they not only execute people, murder them, uh, entrap them, uh, send them to clinics where uh, they use all car sorts of uh, psychological pressures on them and the rest, psychiatric, I should say, uh, but uh, of course they would do it. They, they will do anything that serves the cause. On the other hand, uh, he's not going to engage in activities that he feels are uh, going to be harmful. Let me put it another way. When we talk about, when we try to influence the Soviet by appealing to their morality, uh, it's like two ships going in the night. They have a different view of morality, a different view of the world than we have. What is right and what is wrong. Uh, for example, a uh, pathetic gesture like uh, taking it to the United Nations, uh, figuring that world opinion uh, is going to make them change. 
uh, condemning the Soviet Union and the United Nations is like making faces at the Sphinx. Uh, it isn't going to affect them. Now, what may affect them from a pragmatic standpoint is the realization that if world opinion is totally against them, that then uh, that will lead to a bigger arms buildup in the world and less progress in areas that they want. But they're not going to be affected by an argument that it's moral or immoral to have somebody killed. After all, Lenin, every Soviet leader that has ever lived, has indicated that there are times when lives must be sacrificed for the greater good, any means to an end. There were uh, some criticisms that President Reagan had used uh, this incident uh, to push his own defense uh, program, the, uh, the uh, MX uh, and the Pershing. Do, uh, do you su see anything to that criticism? Well, I hope he did use it for that purpose. I don't know what these idiots are thinking about. Uh, when you have this, this uh, Soviet leadership exposed for what it is, this incident, uh, which is an indication of the problem that we have, uh, that's a very good argument to develop our strength. And uh, I, am, I totally approve of President Reagan asking uh, the American people and our allies abroad uh, to realize the kind of a world we live in. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, and uh, we have to recognize that if they're going to engage in this kind of activity, uh, we've got to have the military strength because that will deter them. They're not going to be deterred by a resolution in the United Nations. They may be deterred by the fact that we have great power and that they run the risk that we would be able to react or might react more strongly than such a uh, resolution. So when President Reagan addresses the issue in that way, he's right on, in my opinion. But you do distance yourself uh, from the conservatives who, uh, uh, the, the, it's not redundant, right-wing conservatives, but you do distance yourself from the conservatives who argue that he should cut off all relations and take much stronger actions. They're out of their mind. I mean, they, they just don't understand how the real world, world works. Uh, so <coughs> we break relations with the Soviet Union. I remember de Gaulle said to me once, uh, we were talking about what was called detente, hard-headed detente, as I would call it, not the soft-headed kind that was practiced in the later administration. Uh, but uh, de Gaulle said, what is your choice? If you're not prepared to break down the Berlin Wall, uh, then you have to talk. And the thing to do is to be talk from a position of strength. Now what we have to understand is that when uh, the, the, what I call, they, they call themselves the hard right or the far right, etc. when they say break diplomatic relations, cut off all trade, isolate them, what are they going to build? I know what they think. They think, well, if we just do that, the rotten system will collapse. I wish it were, but it is not going to collapse. You're just going to squeeze their people more. What we have to realize is that this incident itself demonstrates why you have to have contact. If war comes, it's going to come not, in my opinion, by the Soviet Union launching a massive strike. Uh, they don't want a world, even though they want to conquer the world, they don't want a world of destroyed cities and dead bodies. It's going to come through accident, through miscalculation, or through third party small nations drawing the big powers into war. And as far as accident and miscalculation is concerned, you've got to have more contact rather than less. And this plane incident shows how very close to the edge we are. Uh, an incident of that sort, suppose it had involved not a Korean plane, but an American transport. It would have been pretty tough. What would, what would you have done in a case like that if it, uh, if it were? Would well, that have I'm made the response to, I'm difference? I'm not going to comment upon what I would have done about that, because that gets me into this, and as I said, I, I <coughs> don't comment upon what the president should do. At this point, we take a break. I'm not sure it's useful to print to get all this in, because that's uh,
Now we've covered Truman's legacy on that. Yes, I think the decisions and uh, You, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Marilyn Monroe. Are you aware of the, uh, the widespread rumors that Marilyn Monroe was the mistress of either President Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or, or both, and that uh, her last uh, phone call on the, on the afternoon of her death was to Peter Lawford, and her last words were, uh, say goodbye to Bobby, say goodbye to the President, and say goodbye to yourself because you're a nice guy. Do you uh, have any knowledge or insight into the relationship between the Kennedys and Marilyn Monroe and why, they, why, why the rumors about their fears about her <coughs> diary uh, exist and whether they might be justified? No, I've never gotten into that. I, I don't read those uh, movie magazines and the reports and so forth. Uh, uh, probably should, but I just have never found time for it. One of the, uh, take one last thing on the, the uh, idea of the imperial presidency. One of the uh, charges against the Nixon administration was the, uh, the uniforms, the dress uniforms, the comic opera dress uniforms for the uh, White House uh, uniformed guards. Why'd you do that? Well, as a matter of fact, that was done at the staff level. I was pretty surprised when I saw them. Uh, and I think just some bright-eyed uh, fellow down below thought that would look great. Uh, well, I, all I knew is that I had wanted it upgraded because having been to so many foreign countries and then coming back to the United States uh, as vice president as I had and to see the, the way that we receive foreign guests in such a very undignified way, I know made a terribly bad impression on them. And I said I just wanted it shaped up because uh, I, I would say that at this particular point, uh, the, at the time that I became president, the only more unkempt, if I may use those two words together, uh, security people than the ones at the White House were the ones in the Congress. Uh, it's really disgusting to see these overblown fat people that are basically political hacks running around there to protect the congressman, and that's the way the White House looked. Thank heaven it's shaped up now, and we do a very good job on our protocol. I was only interested in the protocol. As far as the uniforms, I never look at the uniforms. I don't know anything about uniforms. Did you know uh, when you knew Congressman Kennedy and then Senator Kennedy about uh, the health problems, the serious health problems he had that were later revealed? In fact, not only did I not know, but in the discussions I've had with him, uh, he never mentioned it, which I think is a compliment to him. Uh, I understand that throughout the years he was uh, in Congress and in the Senate that he was, had a great deal of pain uh, from what is called Addison's disease and also a back problem of some sort. But he never talked about it, he never talked about his troubles, not to me. Do you uh, feel that his uh, health problems were sufficiently serious uh, that he shouldn't have run, shouldn't have put himself in the position of running for president? No, I think uh, the proof of the pudding there is in the eating. And in this respect, uh, where health becomes an issue and where it should be an issue is when it may have the effect of not allowing the individual to be an effective leader. But let's look at, look at the history a bit here. Franklin D. Roosevelt had had polio. He was crippled. Uh, he became one of the outstanding presidents. Whether you like him or not, he was an outstanding president, a great leader. Uh, you talk about age. Uh, some thought Eisenhower was too aged. Many think Reagan is, uh, no, some thought Eisenhower was uh, too old and Many, of course, campaigned against Reagan at an earlier time on the ground that he was too old. The question is not his age, uh, but the question is, can he do the job? Uh, the same was true of Eisenhower after uh, he'd had a heart attack. Uh, many would suggest that, well, he's had a heart attack, maybe he can't do the job. Uh, but he went ahead, he ran, and he did the job. Now, in the case of Kennedy's health, uh, I would say also in the case of Johnson's health, because the Kennedy people, uh, we're trying to make an issue of Johnson's heart attack in the 1960 primary campaign. But in the case of both, the proof is, can they go through a campaign? A campaign is more difficult 
than being president. And anybody that can go through a presidential campaign is healthy enough to be president. And that's what I say about Kennedy, I say it about Roosevelt, I say it about Eisenhower, I say it also about Johnson. Uh, Jack Valenti has told a story about uh, being in Texas when uh, President Kennedy gave a speech and in fact being crouched beneath the podium and seeing President Kennedy's hand when it was down beneath the podium and uh, that it was, it was shaking, that uh, out, out of control. Uh, the press must have seen uh, a lot of this by that point and must have known about the braces he had to wear. Mm -hmm. Do you think they uh, should not have reported that? Do you think that the public uh, doesn't need to know that kind of thing as long as ostensibly the job is being done in an orderly way? Uh, <coughs> you've stated my position very well. Uh, I didn't know about Franklin Roosevelt being crippled uh, until after the war. Uh, I think that was proper. He was doing the job all right. Uh, as far as uh, President Kennedy was concerned, he was then, of course, uh, as a candidate and then thereafter as president, uh, the fact that he had Addison's disease or whatever it was, unless it affected his mind, uh, I do not believe it is a legitimate issue. Uh, now, I must say, I think the press or the media uh, perhaps were a little less hard on him, if I may use British understatement, than they were on me uh, on some issues. But as far as the health issue was concerned, I think that was proper. Uh, and let me say, too, that in respect to what is called the sex issue, uh, now, apparently, it's been disclosed that there was a lot of hanky-panky going on in the White House in the Kennedy years and so forth, uh, and the bedrooms being used for extracurricular purposes. Uh, I don't want to see any of that. Uh, I don't want to even see it now. Uh, I think what matters is what kind of a president he was. Uh, I think the important thing, however, is that a president, uh, whether it involves uh, that sort of activity or whether it involves uh, profanity or what have you. The important thing is for him to set an example and not blatantly uh, to destroy the myth that people need to have about whoever is president. Do you think the candidates should be required to uh, make public their medical records in a campaign or before or during the campaign? I don't believe so, but I don't mind it. <coughs> I never minded it because mine, naturally from a personal standpoint, because I from the standpoint of my opponents, I'm disgustingly healthy and will probably outlive them all. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, these days when uh, you've got all these psychiatric experts running around uh, and so forth, I think before we get through, we're going to have to have presidents go through a psychiatric examination, spend two, three days on the couch, I mean with a psychiatrist, not a babe, and then see what happens before you're going to allow them to be president. It's gone too far, in my opinion. Maybe a routine health examination so that they haven't got terminal syphilis, but beyond that, I'm not for it. Do you think that uh, having undergone psychiatric therapy should exclude uh, a person from running for president or should influence people's decision whether or not to vote for that person? Well, you had that problem with the Eagleton case, uh, and I would say it would not exclude him uh, unless uh, the the uh, prognosis after the therapy indicated that there were recurrence might occur of a psychiatric problem. Uh, and, but otherwise, uh, these days, uh, that would probably rule out half the population among those that would be qualified to run for president because of the so-called upper set or the better people and so forth uh, not only go into the couch themselves but send their kids in the couch when, rather than disciplining them. Do you think discipline would be better and more effective? Far better, far better. I think, as a matter of fact, uh, if priests and ministers and parents and teachers were doing a better job, you'd put nine-tenths of a psychiatrist out of business. What, uh, what kind of role did uh, money play in John Kennedy's career? Well, very effective. Uh, he, of course, had all the money he needed for personal purposes. He never had to fight his way up. He never had to worry about uh, losing in a campaign for fear that he wouldn't have a job. Uh, the second thing is that uh, it provided him the opportunity to, to buy the brightest and the best. Now, let me make a differentiation there. Uh, not only by buying them, uh, because he was able to pay them, uh, but also, in his case, however, 
he had the added advantage uh, that once bought, they stayed bought. Uh, he was able, to his great credit, to inspire an enthusiasm and a loyalty, which, for example, Nelson Rockefeller was unable to do. Nelson Rockefeller bought the brightest and the best, too. Uh, but Nelson Rockefeller ended up, when a Rockefeller campaign was over, they went to greener pastures, not with the Kennedy. Once the Kennedy uh, a supporter, virtually all, uh, were that way in the future. Now, that's on the plus side. Uh, you have enough money that you don't have the trials and tribulations of, of life that uh, people who don't have money have, and you're able to buy, uh, afford a campaign, you're able to buy a good staff. On the minus side, however, sometimes it's very important for a potential leader to go through the fire. Uh, I've often said that before you win, uh, you've got to lose. Uh, that, uh, uh, that's how you learn how to win. Uh, and so the trials of life can toughen a person up, make you stronger, so that when you have crises, you will have already been through enough that you can take, handle them in an effective way. And as far as staff is concerned, uh, I think I'm a prime example of the fact that uh, money is not that necessary if you have a good cause. For example, after 1966, when I began to ran, run for president for the second time, and this will be hard for people to believe today uh, when people spend millions uh, just to get in the House, let alone the Senate or the presidency or what have you. Uh, at that particular time, I had four paid people on my campaign staff. Uh, Rosemary Woods, uh, my secretary, Dwight Chapin, who handled appointments, Pat Buchanan, uh, who worked with the press, and Ray Price, who was a speechwriter. Four, that's all. Rockefeller had several hundred full paid staff. We beat them. We beat them because mine were totally dedicated. And then we added to that with volunteers. Another reason why a big staff bought and paid for is not always an asset, is that the bigger the staff, the less thinking the man does himself. And when you get in that top job, they're not hiring your staff, they're hiring you. And the more you have to make those decisions, write your own speeches, or at least if somebody else writes them, edit them, uh, the more you have to think the problem through, uh, the better you will uh, be in handling the problem when it comes up. What was it about, uh, do you think, about John Kennedy that, uh, that drew or kept the people that he drew to him with him? I think it were two factors. One uh, was the fact that uh, he, uh, and so far as creative people were concerned, it was that he had imagination, uh, he wanted new ideas, uh, he was an intellectual, so to speak, uh, and he appealed to intellectuals, just as Woodrow Wilson, who was an intellectual appeal. I wouldn't put John Kennedy or any other president, for that matter, in the category of Wilson, who was, of course, the most dominating intellectual figure in our history. Uh, but nevertheless, he had that appearance to people, and he enjoyed their company, and they appreciated that. I think beyond that, though, in terms of the workers in his campaign, I mean not just the speech writers and the idea people and the rest, but those that had to do the grinding work of organizing a campaign, uh, working out schedules, advancement, and so forth and so on. What appealed to them was not what he stood for, but the method, uh, the macho uh, image that he projected, uh, a man that was going to uh, go out and risk all to gain all. Uh, in other words, his, his Harvard side appealed to his speechwriters, uh, who rendered great service to him. His Irish side appealed to the campaign workers, and the combination became unbeatable. Uh, to whom did you appeal? What kind of supporter did, did you attract, and, and what, did they, what did they look for and find in you that, that kept them with you in, in that way? Did you have people with the same intensity oh, yes. that the Kennedys did? Oh, yes, and, and I still have them. In other words, the difference between uh, what we call the Nixon hardcore and the Rockefeller hardcore is that his is gone now. Well, there are a few Rockefeller people around, but, but not really that will carry the torch. Mine are still there even despite what I have been through. We still have a very good hardcore of people, uh, some in government, some outside of government, some in business, some even in the media and so forth and so on. Who are they and, and why are they for the, you? The, the reason that they're for me, I think, is perhaps threefold. Uh, first, that I think primarily there are those who were for me because they believed in what I stood for. I always tried to attract people to a cause rather than to the man. 
I used to campaign speak after campaign speak. I said, don't vote for me as the man. Vote for what I stand for. If you believe what I stand for, then vote for me. And I think the cause, the, my, my uh, what I would call responsible conservatism at home, my internationalism, but hard-headed uh, attitude toward the Soviet threat abroad, that this drew people to me. They saw me as one who could stand for and uh, present the cause that they deeply believed in. That's probably the main group that I have. From the personal standpoint, too, I think that uh, I had appeal, curiously enough, to some intellectuals, but they're very rare. Uh, it happens that uh, most of the people with brains uh, don't go into politics uh, on the intellectual side. They go into business. They can make more money. But in those rare instances where you have intellectuals uh, in uh, politics on the conservative side, I had an appeal to them because my, uh, my appeal was primarily cerebral uh, rather than emotional. A and so consequently, I didn't have very many, uh, but those that I did have in my speech writing and other staff were very, very good. Very proud to have been able to attract them, those things. And then, of course, uh, there were a certain number who, uh, for what reason or other, uh, uh, had a personal attraction, I assume, but I'm not able to speak to that point. Two of those three reasons are uh, cerebral and intellectual rather than uh, emotional or charismatic. Uh, are you making a virtue of adversity uh, to uh, in charismatic uh, terms if uh, on a 10-point charismatic charisma scale, if you were put up against head-to-head uh, -head with uh, JFK, uh, where do you think you would stand? No, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't judge that. I, that. That's something that's... Uh, people have voted on and they express their judgments and apparently I, I think on that score uh, it would come out about even. That's the way the election came out. 35 million to 35 million. Would, if you had had money, would that have made a big difference to your career? I'd probably never gotten so high. Uh, I am convinced, uh, as I said, that money can be a mixed blessing. Uh, I think these days, incidentally, it may be more important. I, I notice when I was in the Senate, I don't think there were more than four or five that were in the million class. Today, there may be 20. Uh, of course, the, the million isn't as big then as it is now. Uh, isn't as big now as it was then, I should say. Uh, but on the other hand, I think what has assisted me in my political career is that I've had to go through adversity. You develop strength through adversity. Uh, it's like what Joe and Lai said when we met. He said. Men who travel a smooth road never become strong, and my road has not been smooth. One of the uh, standard operating interpretations about Richard Nixon is that you're uh, obsessed by money, by wealth, by the lack of it or the lack of enough of it or impressed with it in other people. Do you see that at all in yourself? Well, if I were, I'd have some. <laughs> my, my income is uh, relatively modest. Uh, and uh, I don't have any, except from what, for what I write, because I don't take honorariums, and I don't, uh, I'm not a member of any board or anything of that sort of thing. I'm very comfortable, uh, because my books have been very successful, and my real estate investments, the only thing I've ever invested in, have come out better than most. Uh, but I don't have a great deal. If I were interested in money, I, I would hope that I would have been far more successful than I am. It, it's always struck me as an irony of your career that for someone who claims to be, and in fact the, the records which you have made public at various times bear out your claims, someone who has had a uh, very modest, straightforward, and open book financial history. Uh, indeed, when you write about leaving the vice presidency that you left with uh, $47,000 47, equity and uh, in a, in a an second-hand old Oldsmobile. Uh, that was true, that you were very carefully mm -hmm. conscious, maybe because you felt it was going to be exposed at some time, about uh, keeping records and, and living very frugally and, uh, and, and honestly. And yet you were surrounded by people in the Congress. Take Lyndon Johnson as an example of a man who, uh, from the early 40s when he went to the Congress, never was on any other than a government payroll, and he left a fortune when he died uh, estimated between 14 and 20 million dollars. Uh, there were a number, if not a lot of people in the Congress, at the time you were there, who were, without necessarily doing anything illegal, were just were, were making a lot of money. You didn't, and yet a lot of people 
still suspect that you've got an un, you know an, an, an unlisted Bahamian or Swiss bank account that uh, why, why it, it's ironic that the least likely person against whom these charges should be uh, made is the person against whom they are made. Well, uh, of course, it goes clear back to the famous fund controversy uh, when we had this sixteen thousand dollar a year fund back in 1952, and when finally when it all came out, it it was quite clear the fund was for solely for political purposes, not for personal purposes, as distinguished from the Stevenson Fund, which, because he was a liberal and a Democrat, they didn't go after at all, uh, was used even for personal purposes uh, and, uh, and not just for uh, political purposes. Uh, going back to then, uh, I, was, uh, I have always, of course, been examined very closely uh, by the media and uh, uh, by my political opponents in this respect, and so I've had to be like Caesar's wife. Uh, but I think that as far as the charge is concerned, it's just routine. I mean, opponents have to go after something, and so they, they can't believe that I could have served all this time uh, in, in the uh, Congress as vice president. Then I was practicing law for eight years at a pretty good uh, amount of money. Then I served as president for five and a half years that I could have, shall we say, as modest amount as I have. Now understand, I'm very comfortable, uh, but I'm not in that multi-multi-class that people would expect me to have. Uh, but it's, but I, that doesn't mean that the charge isn't going to be made. Are you impressed by people who have money? Not, no, not at all. Not at all. In fact, most of them are very boring because they, that's all they want to talk about. I mean, I mean, to me, one of the most boring things to do is to go to Palm Springs or Palm Beach or Newport and see the so-called beautiful people who either inherited money and some have earned it, showing off their gowns and their furs and their diamonds and their jewelry and talking of nothing but money and food and houses and sometimes a little sex. But it's a bore. What was it like running against the Kennedy uh, political operation and the Kennedy money in 1960? It was rough uh, because they were smart, uh, they were rich, they were ruthless. And by ruthless, I mean they do anything to win. Uh, you had the operation, for example, of, of Dick Tuck that I referred to. Uh, the, the, the media classified it as just fun and games because they were for him. Uh, in our case, they took poor Don Segretti, who was, uh, an, was today's version of Amateur Hour, and made it out as political sabotage. Uh, all of it, of course, had nothing, no particular effect on the campaign, although it's quite irritating to be heckled and to have your uh, schedule screwed up and so forth, uh, and by have moles in your operation, which, of course, they were very good at. No, they play, they play hardball. I mean, they play. Uh, they may play softball out in the White House lawn over there, but it's hardball, or it may be touch football <laughs> in the on the playgrounds, but it's tackle football all the way. Did you? Uh, could you see the Kennedy money at work against your operation? <laughs> well, one rather humorous example. <coughs> in those days, and thank God those days are gone. Uh, the, the black vote was greatly influenced by black preachers. And in those days, each party used to bid for the support of the black preachers, figuring if you get the preachers, they go out and tell their congregations, you get the black vote. Well, Len Hall was our campaign chairman. He was from New York State. And of course, this kind of thing of buying the black preachers, as they say, we didn't do that in California because we weren't up to speed with regard to what was done back here in the East. But Len Hall, apparently they knew they had been doing that for years in New York. So uh, he made an attempt to, uh, to you know, subsidize some of the black preachers and so forth with contributions and so forth in order to get their support. And uh, he had a pretty good fund to do that. And he came to me one time, he says, my God, I've never seen anything like it. I said, I've paid these fellows more than they ever got before. And Joe Kennedy's come in there and raised me every time. We didn't get one of them. Now, that's just one example. But the main example, of course, I is in terms of the ability to buy time, to buy advertising, to pay precinct workers, et cetera, et cetera. 
and the difference was we were well financed in 1960, but they outspent us, uh, and it's a miracle that we did as well as we did. <coughs> did Hubert Humphrey ever talk to you about his his running up against the Kennedy political operation and finance operation in uh, in that campaign, and particularly in West Virginia? Very privately, uh, he was he was not a crybaby, uh, and he'd say it in sorrow more than anger. But he says, "Boy, it was really something. It was really something." And uh, I know now why he felt it was really something uh, to be up against the Kennedy uh, machine. Uh, because in West Virginia, for example, a state that uh, he was predicted to win because it's 95 percent Protestant, because it's uh, very, very uh, much pro-New Deal, and Hubert Humphrey was much more of a New Dealer than was Jack Kennedy uh, and so forth, uh, and a very poor state, and Hubert made a great appeal to the people on the poor basis, and yet he lost. And uh, one of the reasons he said was that, uh, uh, that uh, the money that was spent, and I've seen a study which indicated that the Kennedy uh, people spent enough money in West Virginia to pay every voter fifty dollars. Well, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I know that Ke that poor Hubert was outspent. But that wasn't the worst thing. It wasn't just you can't just buy the voters in, in any state. The worst thing that happened in, in terms of Hubert was happened to him in Minnesota uh, and in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Hubert was from Minnesota, of course. He was campaigning against Kennedy in the Wisconsin primary. It was very important for him to win Wisconsin uh, because, after all, Wisconsin's in his backyard. Uh, and so it was predicted that he would win. So what happened was that just a few days before the election, uh, the Catholic precincts in Milwaukee and other areas of Wisconsin were flooded with uh, anti-Catholic literature vicious anti-Catholic literature, postmarked from Minnesota. Everybody thought Hubert did it, uh, and the Kennedy people did nothing to dissuade them. It was only learned after the campaign that an aide to Bobby Kennedy did that mailing. Uh, of course, the press uh, was a one-day story to them because, uh, after all, uh, they have a different standard for a Kennedy than they do even for Hubert Humphrey. And another thing on Hubert. For example, the, the use of, uh, uh, of what I call hardball, and I would say, uh, since it's illegal, a spitball tactic, uh, was that the Kennedy people got Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr., Roosevelt being a legendary name in uh, uh, West Virginia, and they got him to go into the state and make speeches questioning Hubert Humphrey's war record. He wasn't in the service because he was legitimately not in it. He, he didn't dodge the draft. But they left the implication that he had dodged the draft, and only after the election did they say, well, we're sorry. Hubert, as a result, I, in, in his memoirs, uh, he, he didn't want to be too much of a sour grape, but he said that uh, beneath that beautiful exterior was a toughness and a ruthless which I shall not forget and do not understand. In uh, Ben Bradley's book, he indicates that uh, President Kennedy had a, uh, a terrific interest in the military records of some of his opponents, uh, Humphrey, and uh, he mentions Rockefeller and the, the man who ran against uh, his brother for the Senate race. Yeah, they did the same thing on Rockefeller. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, President Kennedy, uh, according to uh, one of those, I think it was Bradley himself, said to him, look, you ought to ream out Rocky a little on his war record. Tom uh, Wicker, the, the liberal columnist, uh, wrote uh, some years ago, nobody knows to this day, or ever will, whom the American people really elected president in 1960. Under the prevailing system, John F. Kennedy was inaugurated, but it is not at all clear that this was really the will of the people, or, if so, by what means and margin that will was expressed. Do you think that you were elected President of the United States in 1960? Well, many objective observers believe that I was. I'm not going to s sit here and say that I believe that I was, because uh, uh, I haven't the evidence to prove that I was not, or was. Uh, I will say this, however. There was no question, and these are facts, that there was immense fraud in Chicago, and it was all on that side, not on our side. 
and there was only 8,000 votes difference in this in Illinois between us. Uh, so it's only a shift of 4,000 votes, and I would have won Illinois. Then I needed only one other state, could have been Missouri, could have been South Carolina. A shift of 12,000 votes out of 70 million would have meant my being elected rather than Kennedy. Now the other state, however, where the major charges of fraud was made was in Johnson State of uh, Texas. And there, there were many precincts in heavily Johnson areas that twice as many voters voted as were on the rolls. In fact, there was a, there was a famous story that Johnson used to tell of himself. Uh, Kennedy kidded Johnson on occasion, and Johnson didn't particularly like it, of being landslide Johnson. That was because when Johnson went to the Senate the first time, he won by a very, very small amount. Uh, and he won, they thought, by some hanky-panky, because he played hardball too. Uh, and then Johnson told this story about a little boy sitting on a curb in a, down in a South Texas town. The little boy was crying. And somebody came up to him and said, Manuel, why are you crying? He said, uh, I'm crying because my father was here Tuesday. He didn't come to see me. Oh, but Manuel, your father's been dead for 10 years. I know, but he was here Tuesday and voted for Lyndon Johnson. He didn't come to see me. So in other words, the voting of dead people and the rest, it occurred. Uh, but people say, why didn't, if it did occur, uh, why didn't you do as President Eisenhower and many other urged me to do, why didn't you contest it? Well, there were clear reasons. Uh, I really didn't have any doubt about contesting it, not really. Uh, my heart told me to do it, my head said no. Uh, it said no for this fundamental reason. One, it would be the United States would be without a president for almost a year before the challenges in Illinois and Texas could have been taken, uh, could have been run through. And there was a good chance that we could finance it. Eisenhower was willing to raise money from his friends in order to support that challenge, and I turned it down. Uh, the second reason was and this was because of my travels abroad. I'd been to Latin America, I'd been to Africa, and I'd been to countries in the Far East uh, that were just starting down the democratic path. The United States is an example of a democratic system. In those countries, uh, an election means very little. You have an election that you either fix it, or if it comes out against you, you have a coup and overthrow them, or charge corruption, what have you. If in the United States, uh, an election uh, were found to be fraudulent, it would mean that every pipsqueak in every one of these countries, if he lost an election, would simply bring a fraud charge and have a coup. So I thought that under the circumstances, one, the United States couldn't afford to have a vacuum in leadership for that period of time without knowing who was president, and two, uh, even though we were to win it, the cost in world opinion, the effect on democracy in the broadest sense would be detrimental. So uh, you, you do think it is possible, without reaching a judgment, that you were, in fact, elected the 35th President of the United States in November of 1960? Oh, yes, it was possible. And I think President Kennedy felt it was possible, too. Uh, I remember when he came to see me uh, right after the election, when we were both in Florida at the Key Biscayne Hotel. Uh, the first words that he he uh, spoke after the press left and so forth. He says, well, uh, I guess it's hard to tell who won this election. And I said, well, it's pretty clear that it's over now. I think he was rather relieved when I said that. That meant that, if, that in effect, I was telling him I was not going to contest it. Do you think he was feeling you out to see what you were going to do? Uh, at the time, I didn't think so. Uh, but I know they were very sensitive about that particular point. It could be. Uh, but I'm not prepared to judge that. Did you feel that then or in his later uh, contacts with you that he was embarrassed or defensive because, in fact, uh, he might have been a usurper in your chair? No, I don't think he was capable of that. I mean, after all, he plays hard. Uh, and uh, he, uh, you know, when Mayor Daley, uh, we talked to him on the phone after the election, and Mayor Daley said that, uh, Mr. President, with a little bit of luck, with the help of some good friends out in the precincts, we're going to carry Illinois for you. Well, Kennedy knew what he meant. Uh, and I think that, well, naturally, uh, he's not going to uh, formally approve hanky-panky. On the other hand, he knows that under the system that sometimes happens. No, he, he's never, I don't think he's ever defensive. Uh, I think, however, he, he did feel that because the election was so close, it would be useful to have uh, 
at least make an offer for me to be in the administration, which of course he did offer, and I turned it down. What did he offer you? I, uh, the U United Nations, or something else that I consider to be relatively unimportant, <laughs> but symbolic, it would have been important. Do you think he uh, may have done that in order to uh, sort of co-opt you? No, I don't think he thought I would take it, but I think he thought that it was the proper thing to do. It was a matter of fact, I did the same thing for Humphrey. Uh, the election was close, and I offered Humphrey the chance to go to the United Nations, uh, and he turned it down. Uh, it, it's, uh, th that's, part of the, that's part of the process. Uh, the winner, if he needs the support of the loser, uh, will offer him something. Like, for example, after Johnson beat Goldwater, he couldn't have cared less because he didn't need Johnson. He beat him by so much. And I suppose the same would be true after I defeated McGovern. I didn't offer him a job. Did you uh, take the fact that Kennedy came to you at Key Biscayne rather than you going to him at uh, Palm Beach for this meeting at which he, which he opened by saying, it look, looks like we don't know who won, uh, as a, a sign that he was trying to placate you or uh, appease no, you? No, I wouldn't anyway? say that. I, I think actually it, just, uh, it was just the gracious thing to do. You know, let's understand. He plays hardball, but he has grace. Uh, he does the thing that is right uh, in terms of the manners and so forth. Uh, he tries to. I try to, too. Uh, and in this particular respect, uh, I think what happened here, I offered to come up to see him. We made the appointment by telephone. He says, no, I've got a car and Secret Service and so forth. Let me come to see you, which is quite true. I didn't have an automobile <laughs> and so forth. So under the circumstances, uh, he felt that it was right to and then he also and, th and then, of course, he could well make the point. Uh, I still outranked him. He was still a senator. I was still vice president. He was president-elect. Uh, so protocol rise, he should come, although, of course, uh, I would have gone to see him. It's, um, it, it's one of the canons of the Nixon loyalists that you did, in fact, win the election in 1960. And now, uh, more than 20 years later, shouldn't you study this? Don't you owe it to history, really? to study this and reach a decision about it. Because if you did, in fact, win, as you indicate is possible, the way you acted then and since is arguably the most magnanimous and noble mm -hmm. uh, conduct in the history of American politics. If you think you didn't win, allowing mm -hmm. your supporters to keep this story going is a fairly mm -hmm. cynical manipulation of uh, history. Don't you, shouldn't no, you reach a decision? And, no, and no, I'm not going to get out and say that I did win and then cast a pall on the whole Kennedy record. I'm not going to say that. I will say, however, that I, uh, I can understand how my supporters would do what they're, they are doing. Uh, they believe that. And I would say a, there is a very good prima facie case uh, which we didn't have the opportunity to prove because we did not legally contest the election, uh, that we did win it. Because as far as the, as the vote frauds were concerned, uh, they were on the Kennedy side. Uh, I didn't hear of any cases where uh, the Nixon people uh, were able to, in any state that it mattered for that matter, uh, where, where it was the other way around. In Texas and in Illinois, for example, and in Cook County, in those precincts where more people voted that were on the rolls, they were all Kennedy precincts, never Nixon precincts. That's got to tell you something. Do you, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Sex or? Yeah, well, I'm always thinking about <laughs> sex. That's what, uh, that's probably what sex, did it. profanity. Do you, uh, do you think that the, uh, <coughs> Given, given the enormous frustration you must have felt to have been so near and yet so far, uh, 113,000 votes out of uh, 78 million cast for the presidency, do you, looking back, uh, or at the time, did you feel that you were acting magnanimously or nobly in the way you conducted yourself in terms of not calling a recount? No, I, I, I wouldn't classify what I did magnanimous would you argue or with noble. Those, would you argue with those no, who did so characterize No, I it? can understand how others would, would, would uh, say it. I think I was acting responsibly. Responsible is my favorite word. You do what is the right thing. And the right thing in that case was to do exactly what I did. Do you think that the average politician uh, wouldn't have uh, cried for a recount till the cows come home? Do you think most politicians look at it that way and do the right thing? I think they might have. I think, I think if the shoe had been on the other foot, uh, that Kennedy might have contested it. But I don't know. 
Did you, uh, did you have any idea at the time when you knew him as a senator or a congressman that uh, John Kennedy was the, the ladies' man that he later turned out to be? No, he, uh, he never confided in me about his uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> adventures in that particular area. Were you shocked by these revelations? Not particularly, no. No, I. Why not? Didn't didn't they show a, uh, a a disdain of convention and political propriety that's really sort of breathtaking? Well, to a certain extent, I suppose that's true. But uh, I have I have always separated an individual's personal life from his political life. Uh, you take Franklin Roosevelt, for example. Uh, I respect Roosevelt for a great wartime leader. Now. Uh, all these revelations to the effect of his longtime affair with Lucy Mercer, I don't care about that. Uh, that's between him and his family. Uh, what I am concerned about is how he handled the presidency and what kind of an example he set there. Now, as far as Kennedy is concerned, uh, I will look at his record as president. I will be critical of some of the things he did, the Bay of Pigs, for example, and others. But as far as the, as far as his extracurricular activities are concerned unless that affected his his handling of the presidency uh, I'm not going to be critical of it when I say these revelations are breathtaking maybe they're not breathtaking uh, Henry Henry Kissinger uh, said that power is the ultimate aphrodisiac uh, is politics a, uh, a, a more sexy or a more highly sexed profession than others maybe this goes on all the time well, I guess quite a few politicians have been swordsmen, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that a lot of businessmen haven't been, and even college professors now and then have a little hanky-panky. Didn't you, you once told a story that, uh, was it Richard Russell described the, the, the campaigning conduct of one of his southern colleagues? Oh, yes, Russell and Kefauver. Uh, Estes Kefauver, you know, the, the great uh, fellow, he was my neighbor out in Spring Valley, and I didn't know that he was uh, particularly a ladies' man, but apparently he was. Uh, big, raw bone Tennessee fellow who conducted the investigations of the Teamsters and all that sort of thing. Great hero of all the moralists and so forth. Uh, but uh, apparently Russell was aware of the fact that he knew uh, uh, that he had a few affairs. And, uh, and Russell, who, who beat him in the Florida primary, uh, uh, was saying afterwards uh, uh, how tough it was. He says, this fellow, is Kefauver, he says, he'd go all over the state. He said he'd have a Bible in the one hand and his thing in the other hand. He said something other than thing, but I'll... Do you, uh, Barbara Walters uh, said that you were one of the sexiest men she'd ever met. Uh, what do you think led her to that conclusion? Well, maybe she doesn't know many other men. <laughs> there, um, there were widespread uh, stories, and, and uh, people have expressed not only moral shock, but, uh, but strategic concern about the widespread stories that President Kennedy uh, smoked marijuana in his bedroom in the White House with uh, one of his uh, mistresses, Mary Meyer. And uh, in Timothy Leary's new autobiography, he says that he provided uh, Mary Meyer with amounts of uh, uh, the hallucinogen LSD. And she told him that she was turning on people so highly placed in Washington that she couldn't name them. And President Kennedy apparently joked with Mary Meyer about what would happen if the Soviets staged a sneak attack while, while he was stoned. Given, uh, uh, is, is it simplistic or unrealistic to expect that the President of the United States is going to be stone cold straight or sober uh, for every minute that he's in the White House against the possibility that a sneak attack or some kind of a, a, a crisis mm -hmm. could happen that he'd have to respond to right away. Given the laws of human nature and, and the laws of probability, uh, should Americans worry if the President for an, an occasional couple of hours is uh, high on some substance or other? Well, of course, uh, you can get high on alcohol, and uh, uh, I would say that, however, generally at this time, and I felt this way when I was president, I'm sure that others have as well. Uh, Eisenhower used to have his couple of drinks and so forth, uh, but, but you, you are inhibited. You are inhibited wherever you are. Uh, 
uh, in that office, whether on vacation uh, or in the office itself uh, with regard to your personal habits. I would say that drugs, that's way beyond the pale because they do something to the mind that is, could be even permanent, in my opinion. Uh, alcohol, uh, which of course uh, is more common, uh, is something that has to be taken, uh, having in mind the capacity of an individual to take it. Let me, let me say in one respect, probably the biggest drinker in the White House, at least in the post-war period, was Lyndon Johnson. Of course, he did everything big. He ate big, he drank big, and he was a big man. And I have seen him go through uh, in one night, one of those midnight sessions uh, that we had at the close of the, of the Senate uh, when I was Vice President of the United States. I've seen him go through a couple of bottles of bourbon in eight hours, never drunk. Jo and, and people used to complain la later that when Johnson was in, and the Kennedy people and others had turned against him who had been for him. And they used to uh, criticize and say, well, Johnson drinks didn't bother me because I knew Johnson could hold his liquor. Have you ever tried marijuana? Nope, never. I've smelled it once. But that was, strangely enough, at the 72 convention. I was in Florida at the time, and apparently what happened there, uh, right outside convention hall, there was a huge group of anti-war demonstrators who were there. They all smelled uh, marijuana. And I had, it's, it smells sweet. And I went in and I asked the makeup person, I said, what is that stuff? Because I got my eyes. So that's marijuana. It's the only time I ever smelled it. It was never in the White House when we were there, I can assure you. Never. Would you try it? No. No. Why, why I don't not? Like, I, I don't like drugs of any sort, uh, the uppers, the downers, and so forth and so on. Sleeping pills I have taken because they have to be taken on occasion when you're traveling or when you've had a lot to do. You've got to get your sleep. Uh, but beyond that, I think I just I just don't want to fool with it. My, m I think all of us in in politics, any any kind of uh, of intense activity, we're already very tightly strung, and to add to it just may snap it. Margaret Mead said something to the effect that any uh, young person who went through the later 1960s without having tried marijuana wasn't leading a normal life. Would, uh, unless you know, would you be surprised if you found out that your daughters or sons-in-law who were in college or graduate school then uh, had experimented with marijuana or had used it? Well, I can't speak for my sons-in-laws. I haven't known them all that period of time. As far as my daughters, no question. They would never do it. But that's the example at home. What about there, there uh, have been uh, several uh, allegations